Hi, thank you very much. And special thanks to FOSS Asia for accepting my proposal to talk here. Uh, it's been a bit of a uh, scheduling nightmare for me. And uh, special thanks to all of you all because you all actually soldiered through like four days of everything. There's, I think, a crunchy database talk going on in parallel, and you all chose to stay and hear me. Uh, thank you so much. There's also, I think, a blockchain topic on. So again, very special thanks for that. Um, my name is Yogi, and I don't have a clicker, so I'll have to go back and forth. Uh, I live in Singapore. I work for a company called Pivotal. Uh, I'm a senior platform architect there. I've been there for a little over a year. And what I'm going to talk about today is driven from my experience with Pivotal and my time in you know, uh, various large enterprises that I've actually worked for. This is purely based on on-ground things that I've seen and sort of boiled them down to a few simple recipes that probably might be useful in your daily job or maybe you know somebody that you know may, may be going through the same sort of motion, right? Uh, I am active member of some of the local communities. So uh, are most of you local or you all have traveled here? How many people are from Singapore here? So you're a show of hands. Okay. How many of you all are seeing me for the first time? Wow, I got to visit more communities, I guess now. Uh, I used to be manager for GDGSG and the two new ones are sitting right back there. I was doing not much, so they threw me out. Um, so abstraction, uh, I prefer this being a more interactive session. I don't want you all to go up to sleep. Uh, I already see you like, you know, relaxing there. <laughs> but uh, I, I promise I'll, I'll keep it uh, as lively as possible. Uh, what, do you, what do I mean by abstraction? Like we've all used abstraction as developers. How many of you all identify yourself as engineers, developers? Everybody. Not you? Partially. How was what's that like? I really am really interested now. Oh, so you, you do development for yourself on personal projects? Wonderful. So you are a developer. Well, she she managed to be a developer in a bank, which is great. I used to work for a bank and I know how tough that is. Uh, probably we'll go through some of your pains in this and mine. Um, so simply put, you know, abstraction is all about eliminating non-contextual details, right? To just focus on stuff that matters. When you're building a house, when you start with everything, you just put like uh, a map of four walls. Okay, here's I'm going to have uh, here's where I'm going to have a door. That's where a window is going to go, and you just start with those details. What is the color of the window? What is the color of the door? What walls, what wallpaper is going to be on the walls? Don't care. You start with that basic frame of reference and then you keep adding to it as you go along. Yeah. So the process of abstraction has actually allowed us to move or break down large complex problems into something more manageable. Yeah. In essence, I, I kind of went through a lot of definitions online, in books, and this sort of actually puts what I feel really out there. And this was from a gentleman, John Gutek. I don't even know who that is, but I found the definition to be most relevant to what I'm ta talking today. So keeping the information of the given context there and removing everything else that is not, that probably summarizes the abstraction for me. We are talking about uh, uh, by, uh, for about abstractions. Very specifically, I'm going to focus on large enterprises which have like thousand plus developers. They are managing like you know north of 500 applications. Some places I've actually seen about 2,000 2,600 applications being managed by these. The problem of scale really makes these the the whole concept of abstraction super super important. One of the key challenges with enterprises is that they have very, very huge variety of workloads. You know, ten years ago they embarked on a on a journey to modernize their mainframe workloads. They started actually implementing 
uh, J2E applications, which were very portable. But because of either lack of governance or people rolling through projects, rolling through jobs, these became large monolithic applications. Enterprises have also had uh, message-oriented middlewares where you can uh, throw messages at a middleware through some magic, it goes through the whole system and ends up on the right system. Sometimes those workflows, we don't know. More modern organizations or organization adopting a sort of digital transformation, they probably are on the container or the microservices side, but it's too few and too far apart. Uh, even that is challenging for them because especially with the microservices framework, you end up because you're building microservices, you have these small, small applications scattered all over the place. No, not two of them. You pick up any two of them, they are completely different from each other. How they interact with the system, how they throw out their logs, how, they, uh, how you monitor them, how do you start them up, all those things, they are different for different applications. And hence, the need for abstraction is even more urgent there. That's the, the third, pro second problem which is they have lots of things scattered all over the globe. We all bring our, uh, you know, geographical, our cultural biases into the mix. As a developer, our comments, our, mess, our, our function names, our uh, function flows, they differ drastically. I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. I'm just saying that it's a different thing. It's different things for you to manage. And the biggest of them all, they have a very, very large legacy. Does anyone recognize what's that? Can anyone say which model that is? Because I don't know. I tried doing a Google search. I couldn't find. Uh, it's that old. So we've, we've actually used abstraction as part of our software development methodologies, right? We've used object-oriented programming where, you know, a group of uh, senior developers or a people who have more knowledge around the whole domain, they put together some high level imperative, some high level definitions. And as developers, interns, junior developers, new developers, freshers, they actually start using them and implementing the capabilities. Um, case in point, Servlet API. Servlet API was introduced by Sun back in the day. As developers, it made our life so much easier that if you wanted a server-side component, all you had to do was just extend from the servlet class and package your application and put it in a runtime. And voila, you have an absolutely performing server-side component, which was great until it wasn't. Functional programming. This is still quite relevant. People use this quite extensively. It has regained a lot of focus these days with Kotlin, with a lot of even Go, with Ruby. All these programming languages have re really repopularized the whole aspect around functional programming languages in enterprises. Function functions as a fu functional programming was not mainstream in uh, large enterprises. Only like very specific functions would probably end up using functional programming. But now more and more, I see more and more uh, enterprises actually uh, getting warmed up to the idea. This would be the key focus of our talk today, which I'm already halfway through. Um, the key, the, the abstraction that I want to actually talk about more is all around the runtimes. Uh, Cheyenne before me, even Sini, they, they spoke about Core OS and Fedora, which is uh, actually great. I personally use some of them. Uh, really allows me to especially the workstation uh, containerization, it's a great thing. So when, when it comes to the actual runtime abstraction, first of all, you have no abstraction, bare metals. You have rusty servers sitting somewhere in the data center. You have an SSH access to it at the best, or maybe if you're lucky or unlucky, you will have RDP access into it. Uh, someone would definitely get that joke. but. Uh, Remote, I mean, if you're unlucky, you will have RDP access because it's running Windows. Ah, now you get it. <laughs> so you, you actually remotely connect into it and you go in, you put your binaries there and you run it. You run it as a service, you run it as a 
system D service or init B, uh, choose your poison in that case. Or, or uh, actually, I've seen a, a lot of these actually sitting on the people's desk. You know, it's like you move office and you are like, okay, wh whose server is that? I don't know. We actually had this situation where we were moving an office and there was there were two large Dell servers which always kept me warm in a hot Singapore day. And when we are trying to move, we're like whose servers are these? God knows the guy who actually probably bought them is long gone, but these servers, they are still running. I pulled the plug, never connected them again. Nobody has actually asked me since. So I managed to decommission two servers in a bank. Kudos to that, guys. <laughs> Virtual machines, this is a little more uh, uh, modern, I would say, but again, like in IT industry, modern is maybe legacy in six months time. Yeah, virtual machine, they definitely brought the, the whole idea of uh, scaling more rapidly without being constrained by uh, the physical hardware and to be able to actually uh, have the level of isolation that is needed. Yeah, uh, just in case you're wondering, why I put up put that up? Uh, it's again my one of my Windows jokes. It's a BSOD terminal client. Who knows what is BSOD? Really? Only so few? Times have really changed. Blue screen of death. That's the error message on Windows systems. Hey, I got a green one. <laughs> well, the color has changed finally. I got to put a slash GSOD now. Okay, next time. And then containers our favorite pets these days, right? Everything has to be in container. They are great. I use them all the time. I really, really like them. They are really lightweight. They start up early. They, they have no uh, sort of uh, overhead per se of having an, an entire operating system come along for the ride. But they have their own set of challenges. Like as a, as a developer, when you're actually running applications based off of containers, you have few things that you have to be aware of, right? There are external events, which is not your own code, which makes you actually republish your containers. It could be one of the layers in your container hierarchy that has changed and you need to incorporate those, those changes, right? So yes, they have super real advantages, but there are a few things that actually could be painful at scale. I'm talking about 2,700 application running in containers, maybe about over 100,000 containers. So it becomes a challenge when you look at it at that scale. The last piece, of, the second last rather piece of abstraction is application. This is uh, really, really specialized. It's still containers. At its core, it still is a container. Uh, Cloud Foundry provides you with this ability to take your application and some configuration or some data which is associated with your application and just pass it to Cloud Foundry runtime. It actually creates the container for you based on the workload. So if it's a Python application, it'll create a container that is absolutely right for running your Python application. If it is a Java application, same thing. Ruby, .NET, .NET on Windows, yes. It will actually, oh, you'll be surprised who uses .NET on Windows. Uh, so all the all these things, right? So applications actually take away the pain of managing the containers from you, and it is the responsibility of the platform. You can probably achieve the same degree of uh, flexibility using your own custom pipelines, whereby in your in your code you define some metadata, and the pipeline will take care of generating the container for you. Yes, you could do that, but that pipeline has to be managed by you. And imagine that if you have to manage that for about 2,700 applications, it's tough. So application runtimes actually gives you that flexibility of just throwing your code at it and everything below the application and data layer is taken care of by the platform. Serverless, functions, function as a service, Lambda, all of that is in this space. The latest entrant is Knative, which basically gives you the serverless, serverless experience on top of uh, Kubernetes. So over here, you're not even talking about an application. You literally, sometimes it's just one single file with one function in it. You throw 
throw it to the platform. The platform actually takes care of uh, creating containers for you and running those containers at scale and scaling down to zero when there is no workload running on them. This is probably something that uh, not many people actually put it, put it down as an abstraction. I actually have seen amazing amount of applications that have started using these specialized runtimes. Uh, make no mistakes, these kind of specialized runtimes, they've been there for many, many years. Most of them are closed source, proprietary. You've had TIPCO, you've had uh, you know, BPM frameworks from variety of vendors. This is Spring Cloud Dataflow, which is completely open source based on Spring Framework. The way it does things is based on pipelines. You have individual components, individual applications that are actually stitched together at runtime. All sorts of inter-process communication is taken away from you as a developer and taken up by the platform. So over here, if you look at a simple pipeline here, you have a, an event coming from an HTTP, going into the transformation function and getting dumped into a file. The best part is in your component, which is your HTTP component, you don't have to write anything whatsoever to signify that I need to send the data over to transform. And on the transform side, you don't have to write anything to signify that I'm going to get events from HTTP. The connectivity, the black lines between the components, it's actually externalized. It's a runtime uh, dependency. So you right now, out of box, the components, they support Kafka and RabbitMQ as the connectivity glue. So all you do in your HTTP or transform component is write a single function which takes an object, does the work on it, and returns it. Where does that go, where it comes from, your transform component doesn't care. It's actually taken care by the SCDF platform to do that glue. So in a summary, like I've covered most of these uh, points, but uh, basically for physical host, we have a very, very, it's a very, very small subset of applications that now requires physical host. If you have an application which is written, written in COBOL and needs to be run on a mainframe, yeah, probably that's what it's going to be. But uh, for most of the use cases and anything that was written in, let's, let's say, last 20 years or two decades, you can pretty much skip this and go to a virtual machine, please, at the very least. Virtual machines, uh, typically, uh, if you have vendor-provided softwares, some sort of database servers or any sort of application that has been built, you do get OVS or open uh, VM format or OVAS or virtual appliances as they call them. You get all of that, right? Virtual machines are best abstraction for that kind of workload. Containers, which is on and up and up. Everybody loves containers. Everybody ships containers. Uh, even like Spring Cloud Dataflow, you can actually run it uh, using Docker Compose or even on Kubernetes. You can run it on top of Kubernetes or Docker Compose. And individual components inside that SCDF, they can scale up and down uh, based on the demand. Data services are great for containers. So if you if you have if you want to host data services like Elasticsearch, if you want to Solar or some sort of e even Kafka for that matter, if you want to run, um, you can actually run it on containers on Kubernetes. It totally works. If you want to replatform monoliths, so not everybody is ready for 12-factor uh, cloud-native applications. It requires a lot of investment. If you have an application that has been running for like, like probably a decade and a half, it has so much of logic in it that decomposing it right away is impossible. So first step is to move it to a containerized uh, format so that you at least gain some level of operational benefit. Otherwise, if you keep running it on virtual machines, well, <laughs> it keeps going down. Somebody has to actually go walk up to the server, put the USB in and start, uh, okay, let's do it. So that, that's, uh, that's a use case. 
applications or very specifically 12 factor cloud native applications perhaps you should look at uh, things like google app engine or even cloud foundry for that matter for uh, running these kind of applications and uh, they are best for like any sort of api that you are trying to build across your entire internal system or something like that it's it's really great for those kind of things serverless especially like if you have a very volatile workload that is coming in like it can go from say five requests per second to all the way up to 10,000 requests per second within like minutes. Probably this is something that you should actually be looking at more. Of course, it will require a significant re-architecturing in your systems, but that is probably the best runtime. And if you want like a just run it kind of goodness, right? Uh, with some level of uh, integration involved, specialized runtimes like SCDF is actually a great place. Um, just to put everything in the picture, this is perhaps the money shot. So if you want to take a photo, please do. I'll definitely send out the deck. But uh, yeah, the key is you want to move as center to this as possible without compromising on like the feature or compatibility or ability of your application. You want to choose to move as inside, as deep inside the, these circles as possible. And uh, the moment, the more you move inside, the less flexible the runtime is, more standardizations are in place. As you move out, your solutions will keep getting a less, less and less standardized. So your complexity, your snowflakes in your environment will be very large. That's it. So if you have any questions, I'm sure you do. That bad, huh? All right. Um, the deck would be there. I'm reachable on Twitter with at Yogendra. Thank you very much for staying back and listening. Thank you. Thank you.